Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Stuart Mullen, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the Global Wind Energy Council. As an Australian living in Denmark for the past 25 years, I've become accustomed to the sight of offshore wind turbines powering a nation. And it's actually pretty fantastic to come back to my hometown of Melbourne and to be able to look out into an auditorium that's gradually filling up with people um, that have, that so many people are looking to be doing the same thing here. Uh, this event wouldn't be possible without the sponsors that we've had, so I'd like to thank right from the outset our event ambassadors, CIP, Corio, Shell and Iberdrola, and of course the Victorian state government. Um, and since we've met Minister D'Ambrosio in Copenhagen uh, last, or earlier this year, their support has been unwavering and it's fantastic to see a government that's so committed to making offshore wind happen in the state. We're going to start today with a welcome for country uh, with uh, Ian Hunter, a Wurundjeri elder, but he's coming up in just, but before he comes up, I have a few practicalities to get through. But first, I'd like to actually pay my own personal respects to uh, the traditional custodians of the land where we meet today and to pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and I'd also like to extend that same respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people in the audience today. Uh, as always in a wind industry event, we need to start with safety and uh, we need to have a safety briefing. So there are no fire alarms scheduled for any day that we are here. Um, if you're in this plenary session or if you're in the exhibition area, there are, if there is an alarm, you need to make your way to one of the green exit signs. If there is a reason to be marshaled out to an evacuation point, wardens from the conference and exhibition centre will direct us to those. We also have a conference app, so everyone if in the audience, if you'd like to, if you haven't done so already, take out your mobile telephones. Um, your mobile phone is going to be very useful throughout the entire conference because here you'll be able to ask questions. But before you can do that, you need to actually download the, uh, the app that we have for this conference and you can do that at the App Store or the Google Play Store. Just type in APAC Summit 2023 attendee app and then you will be uh, directed to able to download that app. And the app contains information about our sessions, the speakers, the respective break times, and also it allows you to submit questions. And uh, as a moderator of the panel, we can see those questions as they come in, and then we can ask those questions. There will also be microphones uh, at each located down here if you want to ask a question uh, using the, one of the handhold mics. Also, while I've got your, uh, well, you've got your telephones out and you are downloading the app, if you're missing the information, it'll ask you to log in. Uh, all of your registration details, all of the mail that you got with your registration, that contains the password that you need to activate the app. Uh, while you've got your phone out, just do a quick check to make sure your phone's on silent. Uh, it's always great to have all of these wonderful ringtones that are all customised, but we'd prefer if we can keep those for the breaks. There is Wi-Fi for the summit, and so if you want to access the Wi-Fi network, the network name is APAC 2023 and the password is Summit 23. We have some uh, room logistical information to make sure that we cover as well. So the plenary sessions are here in plenary, this is plenary three, this room. And we also have the exhibition area, which is just across the corridor. Um, and that's where we'll be having the knowledge theater in the morning. So when we're in plenary here in the, uh, in the morning, there's the knowledge center that's also uh, active in the morning. Then in the afternoons, we'll move into the offshore wind sessions and they will be in this room and all of the hydrogen sessions will be in the, on the Knowledge Theatre stage at the back of the exhibition hall. During the breaks, we'll be having uh, morning tea, lunch and afternoon tea and we'll also have a drinks reception uh, this afternoon. They will all be served in the exhibition hall. So we'll start to get a flow between here and the exhibition hall and back. And so people, hopefully by the time we get to lunchtime today, people are used to making that journey. 
Uh, also, while you're in the exhibition hall, please make sure you, uh, you take the time to you know, network and socialise and uh, talk to some of the exhibitors in the hall. Also, apart from our sponsors, we are having representatives from the Gippsland, the Hunter Valley and uh, the Illawarra communities in the uh, exhibition area. So it's a good chance to also get to know some of the local people that are going to be involved in delivering this uh, conference or delivering this offshore wind here in uh, Melbourne or in Australia rather. Um, also, there are a number of you that are speakers here in the hall. If you are a speaker and you do have some presentations, the speaker, if you can drop your speaker presentations off at the speaker desk in the exhibition area, and it's a great idea to do them a couple of hours before you actually do to speak, so it gives a, a chance to get them uploaded and on the system. Uh, if you already have those prepared now, the sooner the better. We'd also like you to share your experience here, so please, uh, we encourage you to post on your LinkedIn, X, Facebook, uh, Snapchat, Be Real, whatever platform you feel like uh, trending on uh, for the next couple of days, so please uh, use the, the, uh, either the hashtag GWIC or the hashtag tag APAC Summit. Um, also, we are having a gala dinner tomorrow night at the MCG. That gala dinner is sold out, so if you have a ticket for the gala dinner and you can't make it for some reason, can you please hand that ticket back into the registration desk or see someone at the registration desk because we do have a wait list of people uh, looking to get tickets to the dinner. Finally, in terms of like what this summit's about, it's really about driving outcomes, and so we'd like this summit to really make a difference for the wind industry. And it's important that we, part, we focus on the pathways forward and we clearly define what we have to do today that's going to make our industry fit for purpose tomorrow. And as a conference, and it's a networking event, so let's have some fun and let's speak to some people that we don't know and let's really see how, we, how much networking we can really do because working together is something that we all need to do in this industry. And I think that you know, opportunities like this actually provide a great platform for that. If you have any questions, you can feel free to address them to anyone in the registration area and they'll help you out. The great people at uh, Waldron Smith can help you out for any questions you may have. Now I would like to bring Ian Hunter th to the stage. Please make Ian welcome. It's only an imaginary fly. <laughs> Thanks, Stuart. Yeah, Ian Hunter, that's, um, that's me. Um, what about that Hunter for an Indigenous person? What a surname, hey? Got nothing at all to do with it. You're going to be totally disappointed. The name Hunter actually um, derives from my family, my father's side of the family, and his father. Um, I dare say the weather would not be unlike what we're having today here, because his father came from Inverness, way up in the Highlands. And um, when myself and my brothers were growing up in the northern suburbs of Melbourne, we had a lot of culture, Celtic, Celtic culture. I grew up, actually, um, I'm actually referred to in my family and close circle of friends as Jock. Owing to the fact that I was the one that mastered what Aboriginal people might refer to as the didgeripos, 
three didgeridoos on your shoulder attached to a screaming possum. Bagpipes. Hmm. Uh, but um, in the last uh, 20 or 30 years, I've uh, done a lot of research about my, myself and my family, and we've realised the fact that, uh, you know, my family on my mother's side of the family, the traditional people from this region here, have probably been here something like 40, or th 40 to 30,000 years or something like that. They've been hanging around in this area here, the Wurundjeri people. And um, so I'm here to welcome you on behalf of those uh, traditional people that have always been here. Um, but um, sort of, it was my great, great three greats, grandfathers, who actually met up with the first Europeans here. And um, it was only four generations back in my family that the first Europeans arrived, not far from here, and uh, met up and um, had an agreement or, um, with my an ancestral people here. And uh, so they actually performed a wumunjikatandaram, meaning giving the bush to the people. They actually gave the people leaves, meaning that they were welcome to be here and uh, partake of the abundance that existed. And this was a, a ritual that our people had carried out for time of time and the beginning of a memorial and whatever. But um, so recently what's happened is a lot of people has actually sort of um, misinterpreted some of my, even my extended family have in, has misinterpreted the giving of the eucalyptus leaves. And some people, sometimes they actually put them on a fire and burn them. Well, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to burn your, um, um, what is it, your uh, passport. And it's like a passport. So, and also sometimes when you give people something that's only a leaf or something like that, they tend to leave it behind. I mean, what do we do with this? Unless it's something impressive that you might use for a, um, I suppose, a bookmark or something like that. And some of our eucalyptus leaves can be as long as that. Well, to do away with that, I've got something I'm going to give you that you can't just give away. See, I was listening to my uh, great aunt being interviewed by an anthropologist and uh, this fellow we actually uh, asked her, he said, what would you refer to yourselves as? And she said, oh, we're Kulin or Wungi. Kulin meaning people. And um, he said, oh, okay, well, what about me? He said, what would you refer to myself as? Um, you're Namuji. Namuji. But hang on, he tried to put her on a spot here, and he said, how can you have a word for something that doesn't exist? We weren't here. She said, well, as a matter of fact, you were. She said, when, and I think she was throwing a bit of humour in here, she said, our old people, when they went to the dreaming, of course, um, if you've got your eyes closed and it's night time and you're trying to dream of someone that has black skin, you can't see them. She said, so those people had to be white ghost people, the Namuji. And um, the local people from Melbourne would know the story about a fellow by the name of um, William Buckley, who happened to be a, an escaped convict way back in the 18, early 1800s. And he was found wandering around with goods and chattels that he'd picked up off a dead Aboriginal person's grave. Fall down, black fella, jump up, white man. Reinforcing that idea with the Aboriginal people's minds. And then if he thought, it, again, he's trying to, she's trying to actually um, confuse my great aunt. And he held up a metal saw. Oh, you wouldn't have a word for this, would you? She said, as a matter of fact, we've got two words for that. Gigo, gumbai. Yeah, but you didn't have metal. Doesn't matter. Gigo means go away. Gumbai means come back later. So um, with that, I thought, there are four words there that I can actually put into a chant. Giga Namuji. Go away, white fella. Gumbalai Kulin. Come back, black fella. Now, in actual fact, um, I performed this in front of some other young Aboriginal people, and they actually, I heard later, they said, oh, that's extremely racist. I said, no, it's not. You've lost the meaning. What it's meaning is... We are all guilty of it. I'm as guilty of it as anybody else, of accumulating material items. But the song goes, it's not even so much as walk a mile in my shoes. It's for a while, every now and then, hopefully this chant's going to be back here and it's going to come out. It's meaning, I want you to be like us, well, the way that my ancestral people were. When I say us, I don't really mean that I'm indigenous. See, I don't classify myself as the indigenous person because that would take away from the fact that my father was of European descent. 
I'm a descendant of both Scottish heritage and both Indigenous, so that makes me a proud Australian. So this chant is wishing, wishing you to be and enjoy things the way that Indigenous peoples throughout the world have enjoyed the land and looking after one another. And the chant goes something like this. Iganamuji Iganamuji Gambala Kulin Iganamuji 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 Gambala Kulin Gambala Kulin Iganamuji Iganamuji Gambala Kulin Iganamuji Gambala Kulin Gambala coolin, giga namuji, giga namuji, gambala coolin, gambala coolin, gambala coolin, giga namuji. Wumjika, welcome to Melbourne, the most amazing place in this world. Must have something going for it for my ancestors have been here for so, so long. So welcome on behalf of the Wurundjeri people, Wumjika. Thank you, and thanks for inviting me along. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian, for that fascinating welcome to country. Uh, now it gives me great pleasure to introduce um, Lily D'Ambrosio to stage, who is going to do the official opening from the Victorian Government. Uh, Minister D'Ambrosio is the Minister for Climate Action, the Minister for Energy and Resource, and the Minister for the State Electricity Commission for the uh, Victorian Government. Mr D'Ambrosio, thank you. Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much, Stuart, for your welcome. And uh, I wish to acknowledge uh, Ian Hunter, Wurundjeri Elder, uh, and uh, all traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting here today. And thank you so much for the welcome to country, Ian. Uh, I've known you for many years, and, uh, and I'm so pleased that uh, you've been able to do the welcome uh, and tell some stories here this morning. I wish to also acknowledge, of course, Her Excellency Ms. Penilla Dalel Cadell, Royal Danish Embassy of Australia, Ben Beckwell, CEO of Global Wind Energy Council, and Kane Thornton, the CEO of Clean Energy Council. And I'd like to, of course, welcome you all to the inaugural APAC Offshore Wind and Green Hydrogen Summit. Events like these are a wonderful opportunity to connect with colleagues and to learn from industry leaders in the fast-moving renewable energy space. Victoria is a pioneer in the development of a thriving domestic renewable hydrogen industry and the home of offshore wind development here in Australia, boasting many competitive advantages. And of course, all of these will support both offshore wind and renewable hydrogen including, of course, the advantages of a highly skilled workforce, our advanced manufacturing and established supply chains, and world-class infrastructure, including roads, rail, and ports. We have abundant wind energy resources. Victoria is the natural home for Australia's offshore wind energy industry. And we have also set ambitious and achievable offshore wind energy targets of at least two gigawatts of capacity by 2032, four gigawatts by 35 and at least nine gigawatts by 2040. Targets that we will legislate later this year to join our renewable energy targets, to join our emissions reduction targets, all to be legislated. To coordinate and guide the growth of the sector, we've established Offshore Wind Energy of Victoria, a body within the Department of Energy, Environment and Climate Action to act as a single point of entry for industry and community engagement. Through OWEV, Victoria is releasing a series of offshore wind energy implementation statements to support and guide industry and the Victorian community on the development of the offshore wind energy sector. Through implementation statements one and two, we've announced an industry-led approach to delivering the first tranche of our offshore wind power. The establishment of Victorian Renewable Energy Terminal at the Port of Hastings as our preferred construction port. And in those, we've also announced that VicGrid, a government agency, will take the lead 
on coordinating the transmission infrastructure for offshore wind. Our commitment, of course, also within those statements is to work with the Victorian traditional owner communities and the broader community. I will be releasing later this year implementation number three, statement number three, which will include further details on the offshore wind energy procurement process and guidance on local content requirements. And we will commence the procurement process in the second half of 2014, with contracts to build awarded by the end of 2025. And of course, the Commonwealth Government has declared an area in the Bass Coast, in the Bass Strait, off the Gippsland Coast as Australia's first offshore wind zone and has invited developers to apply for feasibility licences. The successful applicants are expected to be announced later this year. And in June, Chris Bowen, the Federal Climate Change and Energy Minister, announced a 60-day consultation process for a proposed offshore wind area in the Southern Ocean off Portland. Through Victoria's Offshore Wind Energy Victoria, we are supporting community and stakeholders to engage in this consultation process, including working with traditional owner communities in those local areas to discuss the potential zone. The Commonwealth's consultation closes at the end of this month. And we know that Victoria's leadership in this space is being watched around the world. And I'm really pleased to announce today that Victoria has been formally admitted to the Global Offshore Wind Alliance as its first sub-national member. This is a great moment for Victoria, and it's a testament to our boldness and leadership in offshore wind development in Australia. The Global Offshore Wind Alliance is a leader in guiding the development of offshore wind internationally, and we are proud to have been accepted as a member. Victoria is now part of this terrific alliance of countries and organisations working together to support the establishment of offshore wind energy across the globe and in the APAC region and share knowledge and learnings from international experience. I want to thank everyone who has worked so hard and has made this possible, including our dedicated team in OWEV and to, of course, GWEC, who has supported us through this process. Renewable hydrogen is an extremely versatile energy carrier that has the potential to touch on many parts of Victoria's economy and energy system. For Victoria, a renewable hydrogen economy can capitalise on our vast renewable energy resources, drive innovation and support new sectors to emerge, such as green methanol and other green fuels, and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions across our hard-to-abate sectors, including industrial and transport and take our renewable energy to the rest of the world. We've established our vision to a thrive, for a thriving renewable hydrogen sector in our renewable hydrogen industry development plan, and we are investing in the technologies and supply chains to support its growth. Last year, I announced the successful recipients of our first two renewable hydrogen-specific grant programs, with more than $7 million awarded to a range of projects and initiatives. In 2022, we also launched the $20 million Hume Hydrogen Highway program with the Victorian and with the Commonwealth and New South Wales Government committing to co-design, co-fund and co-deliver Australia's first ever renewable hydrogen refuelling network. This funding will see at least four refuelling stations built between Melbourne and Sydney, the country's busiest highway, and will support 25 line haul heavy freight vehicles that use hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle technology. We're also building the skills and supporting research for the emerging renewable hydrogen industry by providing more than $35 million through the Victorian Higher Education State Investment Fund. And through round two of the Energy Innovation Fund, which I announced in September last year, almost $12 million will be invested in an electrolyzer at the Yarra Valley Water Wastewater Treatment Plant in Wallert. The Victorian Government has also provided more than $12 million to the Australian Gas Infrastructure Group's Hydrogen Park, Murray Valley. It's a renewable hydrogen project, an internationally significant renewable hydrogen production facility. So the growth of the offshore wind and renewable hydrogen industries are expected to create thousands of high-quality, long-term jobs for Victorians. 
And I want to look now at how we are ensuring Victoria's workforce meets the needs of the energy transition, including in these sectors. We're developing the Victorian Energy Jobs Plan. By 2035, we will have created in Victoria 95% of renewable electricity, 95% of all of Victoria's energy supply production will come from renewable energy sources to create, of course, 59,000 jobs and thousands of jobs in apprenticeships and traineeships. And we are working towards ensuring that we have a ready workforce to ensure that we can fill the vacancies that will be created by these very ambitious targets that we have set. So, to close off, offshore wind energy and renewable hydrogen each contribute uniquely to Victoria's renewable energy transition and achieving our targets of net zero emissions by 2045. Through the establishment of offshore wind energy Victoria, the creation of Australia's first offshore wind assembly port and the continued feasibility licence process for Gippsland, we are paving the way for Victoria to become home to Australia's first offshore wind farms. And through our significant investment in renewable hydrogen, we are building the skills and driving the innovation that will grow this sector, supporting our emissions reduction goals and creating a new industry offering long-term jobs, investment opportunities and the potential for exporting Victoria's energy to the world. So thank you very much. I'm so pleased that you are all here. I wish you all of the very best and a very, very successful inaugural conference. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank, thank, you. Very much. Thank, you. thank you very much, Minister D'Ambrosio. And uh, I know that Parliament is sitting today, so I thank you very much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to actually, uh, for Victoria to play a leading role and join the Global Offshore Wind Alliance. It's uh, fantastic. And again, as I mentioned at the start, as a Melbourne boy coming back here and seeing uh, Victoria playing such a major role, it's pretty inspiring. I'd like to invite uh, the CEO of the Global Wind Energy Council, uh, Mr. Ben Backwell, to the stage now to say a couple of words. Ben. Uh, good morning, everyone, and um, th thank you, Stuart. Stuart um, Mullin has been uh, bending my ear about Australia for, for about the last five years. Um, to varying, varying degrees of uh, scepticism on my part, I must admit. Um, uh, but he's proved me uh, completely wrong. And um, the last couple of years have been uh, extremely exciting as we've seen all the progress uh, that Australia is making so quickly around um, offshore wind. Um, now, um, before I start, um, it's been a, a very uh, a rousing and inspiring uh, uh, morning um, already. I want to say thank you particularly to Ian Hunter for coming um, here today and, and doing the welcome to country. Um, um, as a visitor for the first time to Australia, um, I'd like to personally uh, pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the land where we meet today um, and pay my respect to their elders, uh, past and present, um, and extend that respect also to um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, here today. Um, I've been given a, a really overwhelmingly warm uh, welcome since I arrived um, and feeling that I'm only just starting to um, uh, you know, absorb uh, um, you know, the, the culture and, and um, uh, the kind of diverse um, uh, uh, you know, community that I've, I've seen here in Melbourne already just in these last uh, uh, few days. So you know, it's incredibly exciting and, and also um, new for me to be here. Um, so I'm going to say a few words around um, offshore wind. Um, in, in fairly random order. First of all, it's been two years of just such uh, incredible progress for Australia and, and for Victoria in particular. Um, and I want to thank uh, Minister D'Ambrosio and her whole team. I mean, the, I mean, the Victoria has put together this amazing team in, in two years um, and also the federal government. Um, the progress has been unprecedented um, and we've seen such transparency um, is the main thing I'd like to mention. You know, transparency and a process which is going to be built to last and which is built on uh, creating robust um, institutions and processes uh, that people can really engage with and trust. And I'm very confident that that will then lay the basis for 
you know, something really lasting um, uh, and impactful with 50 gigawatts of pipeline already in Australia, we, we believe this can be uh, really uh, transformative. And um, in this world, it's going to be the countries and areas that um, um, are able to create good regulation and good government um, and transparent institutions, in my view, that are going to be the ones that are going to be um, successful. Um, and we can really see Australia uh, playing that role. Um, so that, that's the first thing. The second thing I wanted to mention is that Australia, I think, can play a real role as a gateway to the wider APAC region. Um, I think it's a, a, a country where um, people feel good uh, doing business, where the culture is very engaging, um, and where there are long-standing um, links to the wider region. So, I mean, a fantastic place to do business. And uh, last night I was at the reception that we held um, at Invest uh, Victoria, uh, talking to some of our long-standing members. And it's, it's really impressive how they are already scaling up their teams and creating um, you know, really large teams of experts uh, to engage with this process and, and get their areas um, uh, licensing underway. Um, and and we, this will only grow over the, last, uh, over the next uh, few years. So, you know, first of all, building large teams uh, to deal with all the, the studies and the licensing and getting those applications uh, done. And then in a few years' time, moving into uh, the area of you know, construction and actually getting these projects built. So, you know, really um, exciting. And I think we can already see uh, from, from talking to our members um, just how big um, and lasting uh, this presence is going to be. This is just the beginning. Um, and we want to create something which is lasting and which will be here in, in 50 years' time um, and which is transformative for the um, Australia um, energy system and, and, and for the wider region. Um, the, the, first, the last uh, thing I'd like to say um, in this area is around cooperation and collaboration. Um, you know, we live in a very um, an increasingly unstable world, um, unfortunately, and in a, in a world where politics uh, seems to be getting uh, nastier and, and tenser uh, wherever we look. And it's very, very important. I mean, our industry is built upon uh, cooperation. It's built upon collaboration. It starts, uh, you know, with, it starts with ideas mainly coming from, uh, from Europe and a technology that was established in, in, in Europe and, and, and grows into a, a big regional industry in Europe. It takes 30 years to build uh, through cooperation around the North Sea of European countries, which are not always um, as friendly um, as we'd like them to be, but we, you know, we got our act together and we cooperated across and around the North Sea to build this industry. Um, and Asia, really, to be successful, is going to need to do the same thing. So we really need to find a balance between um, our own national um, uh, you know, industries. Um, everybody um, is, is uh, going to rightly um, want to get supply chain jobs uh, from this and industrialize their own sectors. Um, but we also need to cooperate around um, industry, um, around countries' particular uh, national advantages, also around logistics and shipping. Um, it, you know, it's really, really important that we build an ecosystem across the APAC region uh, to be able to install these you know, really huge amounts of power um, that we're going to need to install. And um, we, yesterday, we launched the Global Offshore Wind uh, Report. Um, it shows um, that something like 380 gigawatts of offshore wind are going to be built um, over the next decade. Now, 49% of that will come from the APAC region. So it's, it's, a, it's an absolutely gargantuan uh, task uh, uh, for us. There's a real demand and a necessity uh, for this. And there's not many alternatives. Um, but we need to work together to do this, and we need to get the balance right between um, creating the right incentives for local industrialization and jobs, but also collaborating across um, the wider industry. And then just finally, um, I wanted to say something, and this relates to uh, what Ian Hunter uh, said this morning. Yeah, this is about community as well. We're not going to be able to build any of this stuff if people don't want us to. Um, and you know, we can see you know, it, it, it's so important to have people on our side as an industry uh, right from the beginning. And, 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 and again, something I've been very impressed with since I've been here is how quickly people are setting up um, institutions, people are reaching out across communities. Um, I was speaking to um, some, some colleagues who'd set up the Women in Offshore Wind um, 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 uh, uh, organization Alliance uh, yesterday. Um, you know, it took, uh, we, we started doing uh, these kind of things you know, in GWEP five years ago with, an, with a mature, in, uh, mature industry. Australia's already creating these kind of net networks and ecosystems right now at the beginning. And uh, I think these things are going to be so important. Um, and it's about um, the wind industry acting as a, as a really good custodian um, of the areas where it works. It's about uh, 
making the oceans a better place rather than a, wor a worse place. It's about working closely with communities. It's about establishing gender uh, parity and diversity and a just uh, uh, workforce as well. So all these things, we won't be successful unless we reach out to communities. Um, I'd like to just thank a few um, uh, people just to end. Um, I mean, first of all, to, to um, uh, Minister Ambrosio, who's had to go to Parliament now. We will see her um, again uh, tomorrow. Um, also to the Australian Government, the Department of Climate Change, um, Energy, Environment and Water. We will have the Right Honourable Minister Bowen um, with us uh, tomorrow. And we're pleased to have Deputy Secretary Joe Evans um, from the Department of Climate Change uh, joining us today. As I said, the Australian Government um, has been so proactive. Um, I met with Minister Bowen um, in the, the rather strange conditions of, of, of uh, COP27 in, in Sharm El Sheikh. And, um, um, you know, Im you know, immediately he came and said, you know, what's, what's, what's this alliance that you're, you're involved in? We'd, we'd set up the Global Offshore Wind Alliance with the, the Danish government um, and the International Renewable Energy Agency. And he, you know, within the course of, of, of you know, several days, um, you know, uh, managed to get the process going so that Australia became uh, a member of, of GOA in, in very, very short um, order. Um, and um, that kind of leadership, um, I think, really you know, is, a, is a statement of intent from Australia. And, and, and then today we've seen um, the state of Victoria in its own right joining, uh, which is you know, just in incredibly um, exciting. I'd also like to say a welcome and a thank you to all the overseas uh, government delegations that have come here, particularly from the Philippines, from Vietnam, uh, from India, from Sri Lanka, um, and also to the World Bank Group um, for, for supporting uh, uh, this event. I mean, there's, there's huge statements of ambition now coming from Vietnam, from the Philippines, from India, and, and all of these places are going to be major markets. And, and I think, again, cross-fertilizing between what uh, the different countries are doing, seeing how we can collaborate on supply chain, on skills, and many other areas, um, is going to lead to uh, you know, really great opportunities uh, for all of us. Um, I'd also like to welcome Her Excellency uh, Ms. Um, Peril uh, Dala Cardell from the Royal Danish Embassy um, for Australia for making the time to be here. We've worked so closely with Denmark um, in setting up the Global Offshore Wind Alliance, but also for many years um, on offshore wind more, uh, more generally, and many times have, have, have gone to the Danish government when we've needed help. Um, in different countries to, to make uh, 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 diplomatic relationships or, or, or government relationships. So thank you, um, uh, Your Excellency. Um, um, and um, finally, you know, for people who've come here uh, from such a long way away, um, and I particularly wanted to give a, a warm welcome to um, Henrik Stiedstil, who's sitting here in the front row. Um, for those who don't know, I mean, Henrik is really the, the pioneer and one of the founders of our industry. Um, we were very pleased to have him recently in London at the dinner to celebrate the one terawatt um, uh, mark for, for wind industry. And, um, you know, Henrik um, really was at the, the forefront, installed the first um, uh, offshore wind uh, project um, in Denmark. And it's just uh, great to see him here in Denmark and I, uh, in Australia. And I'd really encourage um, all of you to, you know, if, if he has time to come and say hello and, 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 and talk to him. So, Henrik, thank you for, for coming here and supporting us. Um, and then finally, um, to all our event ambassadors, um, our Platinum and other sponsors for supporting this summit, uh, we couldn't do these, uh, these things without you. Um, and this is about putting down a marker. This is about the beginning of something um, and something that you know, is important and is going to be here for many, many years um, ahead. So you know, thank you all of, all of you. This is, this, is the, this is the beginning of something uh, uh, great, which is going to leave um, a, a lasting uh, um, legacy. So um, thank you. And I'm going to hand over to uh, Kane uh, Fawnton, who's the CEO of the Clean Energy Council. The Clean Energy Council is our partner um, here in Australia. And again, we've worked very, very closely with them um, over the years. I've actually known Kane for, for many years. And um, um, uh, you know, CEC is, our, is the uh, peak body for renewables in Australia. We'd encourage uh, our members to talk to, to them if they're not already members. And um, we intend to do very much more in the future. So Kane, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Ben, and uh, to your team. Welcome to Australia. Stuart, welcome, welcome home. It's great to have uh, GWEC and, of course, the global perspective uh, that you bring uh, focusing uh, on Australia and in particular here in Victoria. And I think we've just heard from the uh, Victorian Minister as to why uh, Victoria uh, has, I think, rapidly become the, the epicentre 
for the offshore wind industry here in Australia. Uh, can I also acknowledge uh, Ian and his uh, wonderful welcome to country. Uh, I was uh, born and raised on Wuthering land. Um, I now live uh, and indeed raise my own family on Wurundjeri land. Uh, and I too would like to pay my respects to elders past, present and future. And I think uh, as an industry, I think we have a lot to, a lot to learn, a lot to understand. And I think, frankly, some work to do in terms of how we as an industry uh, not only engage with First Nations people, but actually genuinely partner with First Nations people uh, in all of the exciting opportunities and projects that we're part of right around this, this country. Can I welcome uh, all of our international guests here at this summit? Welcome to Australia. Uh, we are, as a nation, on our way to becoming a global clean energy superpower, and uh, I think uh, it's critically important that we draw on the expertise, the uh, capital, the skills, the supply chain uh, and the capability that each of you have and have developed either here in Australia or elsewhere around the world. I, I think it's clear that many other countries have a head start on Australia in reg regards to the offshore wind uh, opportunity, uh, but that's now changing rapidly and as we've already seen and heard, uh, there's enormous progress and momentum right across this nation. Uh, such that I think uh, Australia is now on our way to becoming a world leader for offshore wind. We've got a lot to do, uh, but we've got some critical fundamentals. Uh, firstly, some of the best offshore wind resources anywhere in the world. Uh, we have, as we've seen and heard, strong and united government commitments and collaboration. Hasn't always been the case, uh, but now we have governments working hard to set clear policy, put effective regulatory frameworks in place, and I think most critically, work collaboratively and constructively to set this industry up for the future. And finally, we have a strong industry that draws both on Australian know-how, but also global experience. All of that coming together, working effectively under the Clean Energy Council. The foundations are being established, as we've already heard, two areas now formally declared, two more open for consultation right now, and more to come. Areas already declared, totaling more than 23,000 square kilometres, with theoretical potential to accommodate up to 34 gigawatts worth of offshore wind projects. Massive growth in propo proposed projects over the last 12 to 18 months, with an estimated 54 gigawatts worth of publicly announced projects. Now, we know not all of these will get licences, but it does show the scale of enthusiasm and focus on the offshore wind market here in Australia. So what do we need to do now? And I think Ben touched on many of these elements. We need strong and effective regulatory frameworks. We need strong market-based policies that underpin the enormous capital investment and pull through projects to finalisation. This policy needs to recognise the global competitiveness and the race that Australia finds ourselves in. A race for capital, a race for supply chain, for the workforce and the construction resources and fleets necessary for offshore wind in Australia. We need enormous industry development right across the sector. We need port upgrades, supply chain development, workforce development, transmission and grid. And finally, but I think most importantly, we need to share the ocean and the coastline. We need to minimise the impacts of construction and operation on marine mammals and seabirds. We need to ensure that we recognise the importance of community, and in particular our First Nations communities, fishing industries and the communities right around the country. So we have a lot to do. We must do it together and with leadership. Certainly the Clean Energy Council is continuing to step up our leadership of the industry and I welcome all of you to become part of the Clean Energy Council and join us in this journey. I want to just briefly make a few comments on green hydrogen. Australia is also ideally placed to become a globally significant producer of green hydrogen and its derivatives like ammonia and methanol. Again, our abundant renewable resources and expertise in engineering and pedigree as a major energy pr producer and exporter mean we have the recipe to deliver some of the lowest levelised costs of green hydrogen in the world. We currently boast the largest pipeline of potential green hydrogen projects in the world, equivalent to over 10 million tonnes per annum. There are over 100 projects, 
about a third of which are large scale and a few of which are among the largest green hydrogen projects in the world. So we can see the opportunity is very large and our task in the coming years will be to convert that opportunity into a reality. We've seen a significant initial commitment by the Australian government this year to support at least two large scale projects that get up and running via its $2 billion hydrogen Head Start program. This is a great first step for Australia. But international competition for green hydrogen is red hot. We can't be complacent and more will be required. So it's an extraordinary opportunity and moment for Australia's future. And we look forward to working with everyone here today, right across the industry, to unlock this enormous opportunity in offshore wind and green hydrogen in Australia, and setting us up to become a global clean energy superpower. Can I thank again GWEC for bringing this event to Australia and to Melbourne. We're really excited to be partners of this event. Look forward to an exciting three days here at the summit. And of course, if that's not enough for you, Come back and join us and over 10,000 industry leaders at the All Energy Summit here in Melbourne later in October. And of course, the world will be coming to Australia next April when we host in South Australia in partnership with the federal government, the Australian International Renewable Energy Conference, because we think Australia has a lot to learn from the world, but also an extraordinary story to tell on our journey to becoming a global clean energy superpower. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Kane, and, and particularly thank you for, uh, for making those remarks also around uh, uh, green hydrogen. Um, uh, 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 we, we're working very, very closely um, as this um, uh, industry emerges. In fact, um, um, as you know, we organise this event with the Green Hydrogen Organisation, uh, which is um, uh, also in the Global Renewables Alliance with us. Um, its CEO, uh, Jonas Moberg, I think is sitting here somewhere um, in the audience. Um, its chair, uh, Malcolm Turnbull, was at the uh, reception uh, last night. And, uh, you know, we, can, we can only see this collaboration uh, uh, growing and growing in coming years. Um, I'd like um, to welcome uh, now Her, um, her, her Excellency, uh, Ms. Peril uh, Dala Cardell from the Royal Danish Embassy um, Australia, who's going to make a few remarks. Your Excellency, please take the stage. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the very warm welcome here. I would like to start out also by thanking Jan Hunter for the welcome to country and acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land uh, that we meet on today and pay my respects to the elders past, present, and emerging. I would also like to pay my respects to Minister D'Ambrosio. I know she ran off to uh, take care of important things in a democracy dealing with, with uh, discussions in parliament. But I would like to recognize her leadership in, 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 in seeing the offshore wind industry in Australia actually maturing uh, as we see. It is a great pleasure for me on behalf of the Global Offshore Wind Alliance to stand here today in Victoria and welcoming Victoria into the Alliance. I think it's, it's to see the leadership that has been provided by Victoria um, in this industry has been very inspiring. Um, and I know that it is, it, it, there's a lot to do from now and onwards, but to see Victoria uh, becoming a part of the Alliance, it will enrich the Alliance tremendously, just like it did when Australia a few years ago decided also to become a member of the Alliance. Um, it has been fascinating, the years I've been in Australia, I've been here now three years, and it has been fascinating to follow how offshore wind has come from being the odd kid out in the corridor to being a recognized hardcore center of Australia's uh, green hydrogen, uh, green, green uh, transition. And I would like to thank uh, also the federal government for picking up and, and for, for the engagement and the leadership that's been shown in seeing where we are today. Today, standing here knowing that the offshore wind industry in Australia is a, it's really at the cusp of seeing it taking off, and it's just a beautiful moment to be a part of that, of that uh, development. Um, coming from the Global Offshore Wind Alliance, uh, I would also like to just bring in a few touch points of, 
uh, of some of the issues that we have seen various places that are essential for seeing a success in this industry, and both Kane and Ben have touched upon some of them, but just in, in, in brief summing up, just a few of the points uh, seen from, from the Global Offshore Wind Alliance perspective too. First and foremost, to get to the point of scale, where it is convincing for industry that this is actually going to happen, that it's going to be big enough to be sure that it's worth the while coming here and to avoid the boom and bust um, in the development so that it's a, it, it's a steady stream. The second thing I would like to touch upon is the essential of, of ensuring that this is regarded as a national project. Um, ben, you were talking about the importance of regional cooperation, and we will get back to that. Um, it is important also seeing, seeing from an Australian perspective that it's a national priority that this sector takes off and to find a way of ironing out um, the cooperation between the states at the and the national, the federal level um, so that it becomes uh, a very smooth process. The third area that I would like to touch upon is the importance of, the, of, of financial support for the sector. This is a new sector, and in order to get it established, to find the right, right balance so that the financial support is there to see it take off. And the third area that I would like to just, uh, the fourth area that I would like to just touch upon is the issue around speed, that it is essential. It's something we're all struggling with, I think, but it is essential to get speed into it so that decisions are made quickly it's important to get it right, but it's also important to get it right fast. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing over the next few days how all these issues will be unpacked and how we can get the discussion going, uh, not just on the Australian uh, projects, but also on the regional projects. And I'm sure that, that the next few days will give new impetus and new, new energy into how we see the offshore wind energy industry in, in Australia take off. And I just want to finish by encouraging you all to, uh, to and wish you all to have really good conversations the next few days. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Ambassador. Um, I'd like to now uh, welcome to the stage uh, Deputy Secretary Joe Evans uh, from the Australian Government's uh, Department of Climate Change, Energy, um, Environment uh, and Water. Uh, who's going to give a keynote around the role of offshore wind and green hydrogen in Australia's energy transition. Jack, welcome. Okay, uh, thanks Ben, it's uh, great to be introduced that way and it's just so uh, exciting to hear so much enthusiasm from all the different speakers this morning already about the potential for offshore wind uh, in Australia. Uh, it's it's a really an honour as well to be able to speak at this sort of inaugural APAC uh, Offshore Wind and Green Hydrogen Summit here in Melbourne. Um, it's, it's great that you had Minister D'Ambrosio here. I agree with so many of the other speakers, including Your Excellency, about the significant role that Victoria is playing in, in pushing the uh, offshore wind industry uh, forward in Australia. Uh, and you will get to hear from my own minister tomorrow at 10.30, so Minister Bowen will be speaking uh, with you then. Uh, and also acknowledge the Global Wind Energy Council for bringing us together for this summit for the first time and, and acknowledge that that's been quite an effort, especially since it's come together in a relatively short time. So I would also, if we can move the slide forward, I'd like to give my own acknowledgement uh, to the traditional owners of the NAM, uh, the Wurundjeri Warrior Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation, and give my own respects to Elders past and present uh, and acknowledge and welcome any other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be attending today's event. I think you've heard uh, repeatedly already how important it is for this industry uh, to make sure it is engaging with community and in particular engaging with the traditional owners of the lands and the seas uh, in which uh, offshore wind and, and the hydrogen industry will develop in Australia. Uh, it's very important to us as the Department of Climate Change, Energy, the Environment and Water uh, to have their interests at, at, our, at the centre of what we're doing um, and make sure that we uh, benefit from the really deep knowledge that our traditional owners have to bring to getting the growth of these industries right over the coming years. So I thought I would spend the time uh, just giving you a little bit more detail about the context in Australia, about where the context in which offshore wind and hydrogen are developing, and then uh, turn 
uh, I think it was Stuart that, um, that acknowledged the role that Australia also has in the APAC region. So I thought uh, I'll turn at the end just to sort of acknowledge a couple of things that we're doing specifically in that more international sphere as well. But if we can move to the, the next slide. I just wanted to provide a bit of context about you know, why is offshore wind in particular, but also hydrogen going to be important for Australia uh, over the coming uh, decades and years ahead. Uh, and that's uh, set largely by our climate change uh, ambitions. So with the, the government that was elected in May of 2022, we have new targets for our emissions reductions in Australia, and those are both legislated now uh, and quite ambitious. So the first target is to get to 43% emissions reductions below our 2005 levels of emissions by 2030, uh, and then to get to net zero emissions by 2050. And we put both of those, the government has put both of those targets now into legislation, so uh, we really have to achieve them. Uh, one of the things we have to do if we're going to get to those targets is to really decarbonise our electricity system. And so there's a specific target there to get our electricity system in Australia to 82% renewables by 2030. Uh, and in the process of doing that, we need to develop a whole bunch of new industries, including hydrogen, uh, and uh, Kane already mentioned the Hydrogen Head Start program, which, and, I'll, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. But so all of this is about uh, moving towards decarbonising our industries here in Australia and providing the really clean energy that we need to do that and taking advantage of the fantastic resources we have in Australia uh, to make that happen. Uh, so if we can move again to the next slide, please. Uh, so in terms of offshore wind specifically, you've heard already from a number of speakers about the fabulous resources we have in Australia, really world-class wind resources off the coast, particularly in the southern regions of Australia. Um, the next uh, part of the story though, and, and Kane sort of mentioned that it's great to have collaboration between the governments, and we do, with Victoria in particular, we're working incredibly closely. But I did want to acknowledge that this sort of general support for the development of the offshore wind industry has in fact been around for a few years, longer than the current government as well. So the previous government in fact passed the Offshore Electricity Infrastructure Act in 2021. Uh, and so it's quite bipartisan even at the federal level uh, to see this industry develop and be successful in Australia. Uh, but it's fair to say as well that since uh, the current government came to power at the, at the beginning of last year or middle of last year, that things have really accelerated. Uh, and so we did de declare the Gippsland zone uh, of offshore wind um, resourcing in December of 2022 and the Hunter Zone was declared um, in July of this year. And I just wanted to speak a bit more about that. Um, and again, if we put the next slide up, it'll show you how these zones are sort of rolling out across Australia. So what you've got here is a map that's showing the type of wind resources. So the green areas um, are the sort of relatively mild uh, wind areas. And, and as you go down, you get to those sort of yellow, orange and red zones um, that have really got exceptionally good uh, wind resources um, to use for offshore wind. And what we did, uh, you know, in collaboration with the, the federal, you know, with our, with our political uh, masters at the time, um, but also in, co in consultation with all of the states and territories, we looked at the different places across Australia that might be able to support um, an offshore wind industry, not just looking at the wind resources offshore, but also looking at you know, what were the port resources that were available? What was the community like? Um, was there likely to be, you know, the, the, the ingredients for success uh, for an offshore wind industry? And we identified six areas where we thought there was really going to be a great chance of success. Uh, and so those are the ones that you see on the map. The Hunter, which has already been declared, the Illawarra that's currently under consultation, the Gippsland area also already declared, um, we think there'll be an area in northern Tasmania. Uh, there's already one under consultation in the Southern Ocean, and we also think there should be one around the Perth Bunbury area. And those latter two, we would expect to be opening sort of sometime in, in, the, in the next uh, six to 12 months for their sort of processes as well. Uh, so really moving quickly um, to show where these areas of potential are and really thinking carefully about how we uh, set out the areas so that we 
maximise the chances of success. Uh, so, for example, you know, when we consulted on the Gippsland area, it was much larger when we first went out and engaged with the community about the kinds of um, opportunity that was there. And we listened very closely to the feedback and we thought carefully about some of the impacts on things like the environmental, um, like, well, spe specifically the orange-bellied parrot, which is a threatened species here in Australia, um, that has a flight path through uh, some of these areas where uh, the offshore wind zones are under consideration. And we very deliberately have then declared an area that took as much of that into account as possible to maximise the chances of uh, these areas becoming very much embraced by the community and supported as the industry developed. Uh, so we're hoping that that will uh, continue to be the case as we go around. We'll listen very carefully to the community, including to our First Nations uh, peoples, uh, hearing their concerns as, as much and, as, and embracing that as much as we can as we declare the areas and create spaces for this industry to develop. Uh, so, we are moving ahead at pace uh, and, and we see lots of opportunities. It doesn't mean that uh, we are sort of completely on the home stretch. So, on the next slide, if I can go to that, we are just um, acknowledging, and you've heard again from a few speakers this morning, you know, some of the things we have to look at in terms of getting the pipeline of projects right, getting that smooth, looking at the supply chain, how do we make sure that things are ready and able to support this industry as it, as it develops. Um, you've heard about ports needing to, to be developed and so on, and our, our clear desire uh, to bring on local manufacturing and workers, because that's, you know, in some ways, uh, many of the ways that we, we get the jobs uh, and the industry development that we would be looking for for Australia to get the most benefit out of this industry. So there's still a lot to do, even though we're running fast. And I just wanted to... Um, it's, been, it's been really nice over the last... Uh, sort of last night and this morning to actually hear the acknowledgement of the work that uh, my team has been doing. And I think uh, hopefully here in the audience you have Belinda Wilson, Kathleen O'Kane and Su Susie Cropman, all women of offshore wind. Uh, so I hope they will also be a part of that organisation. But they're just doing a fantastic job uh, and they really are uh, sprinting to get this work uh, in place and the declarations and those zones uh, in place ready for the offshore wind industry to take off. Uh, but I do want to speak briefly about hydrogen as well, because hydrogen is another great opportunity for Australia. So if we can move, actually, just go past the next slide and onto the next one. Great. Uh, so you've also heard um, from the minister this morning and from others how important hydrogen is to the ambition that we have to decarbonise in Australia. So again, very ambitious emissions reduction targets. But Australia, when you look at us, you know, at the end of the day, our own emissions are only 1.3% of global emissions, and that's not to say we don't need to do our bit in getting to net zero as quickly as possible, but it also says we can actually do even more if we can build an export industry based on the fabulous renewable energy resources that we have here in this country uh, and contribute that ability to reduce emissions to other parts of the world. So it's... You know, if we've said there are one tool, many uses, we will be using it in Australia, particularly for our hard to abate industries uh, that need hydrogen to, to re replace the kinds of fuels that, that for which electrification is not possible. Uh, but we will also be looking to service the international demand that is coming for hydrogen in you know, all those different applications that you heard Minister D'Ambrosio talk about. In terms of the opportunity that's here, if you move to the next slide, Kane um, mentioned the pipeline of projects that has been uh, in Australia, and there have been like, more than 100 projects announced here. Our, our understanding is that it represents kind of 40 per cent... Sorry, let me get my, my bearings to give you this statistic correctly. Um, Yeah, so we, we as, as far as we're aware, that represents 40% of all the global renewable hydrogen projects that have been announced to date. Now, we're aware that Australia needs to keep up with the pace of the, of, at which the global community is, is running. So we've had a hydrogen strategy since uh, 2019, uh, but in order to respond to all of the changes that have been happening globally, and you know, the most obvious one is the subsidies and incentives that have been put in place by the United States through the Inflation Reduction Act, but they are not alone. There has been responses in Europe, there's been responses from Canada, 
And so we're very conscious that for Australia to really take advantage of our, you know, our land mass, our ability to produce renewable energy and our ability to turn that energy that renewable energy into hydrogen, embody that in the kinds of goods uh, that we've always been known to export, green iron, green steel, which will come green aluminium down the track. If we're going to take advantage of all of that, then we need to keep up with the pace. And you have seen the first down payment on that from the Australian government in the form of the Hydrogen Head Start program. It's a $2 billion investment to say, let's give production support uh, to the first two or three large hydrogen production, green hydrogen production facilities that can come online in Australia in the next couple of years. Uh, and support that with the existing program of regional hydrogen hubs that's already been a sort of $500 million investment to make sure um, that we have the infrastructure in place and shared infrastructure in place um, to make this industry su a success as well. Uh, and again, uh, when we looked at those hubs, we took that same approach of scanning for where would be the places that would have the most chance of success, and we've chosen and invested in those areas for those reasons. So let me finish just with two last slides that just put that Australian context, I think, slightly more into the global context that some of you would be interested in. Uh, and the first thing I wanted to mention on that is that we have been working ever since uh, we started the, the hydrogen strategy in 2019 and continuing as we refresh it. One of the key things we said in there was it's really important for us to develop a scheme that can demonstrate to the world um, how we have produced our hydrogen and allow the market to then purchase exactly what they are looking for. So this is the transparency arguments you've already heard about this morning being really clear about how we've produced our hydrogen and why it's, it's genuinely uh, renewable. So we have been putting a lot of effort into getting those foundations in place here in Australia. We've invested uh, uh, a lot of funding to both do the policy work and develop the systems to enable a guarantee of origin scheme to trace that hydrogen through the supply chain and be able to demonstrate to our trading partners that we have a genuine uh, renewable hydrogen product. Uh, so that will provide the transparency that uh, people are looking for and we hope unlock the trade and decarbonisation opportunities. And the last thing that I want to go through with this final slide, if you could move to that one, thank you, is that we are working in collaboration with many of our APAC neighbours, uh, so particularly with India, uh, Japan, Korea and Singapore, but that's, that's not an exhaustive list. Um, we uh, are looking for opportunities to collaborate with them on hydrogen research. We're looking for opportunities to collaborate with them on developing supply chains. And we are pulling in the expertise that we are developing, including through our relationships with other countries. So great work that we're doing with Germany and uh, with Denmark to pull that knowledge in and share it with our APAC partners. Uh, so we are definitely taking a, not just Australia, but looking at the region to develop this industry perspective. So thank you very much for letting me uh, lay out um, that uh, picture, both of what's happening here in Australia to develop the offshore wind and green hydrogen industry, clean hydrogen industries. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to the rest of the conference and the panel this morning. Thanks. Thank you, Jack. Thank you very, very, very much, Joe. And, and just to reiterate, I mean, congratulations to your, your team that's worked uh, so hard on this the last, last couple of years. It's been great working with you. Um, I'm going to welcome to the stage now uh, Ms. Uh, Amisha Patel, who is uh, Global Director of Public Affairs uh, for Offshore Wind uh, for GWEC. Um, Amisha leads on our work with the Global Offshore Wind um, Alliance, that several people have mentioned um, already, and is on secondment actually from uh, mainstream uh, renewable power. So welcome, uh, Amisha. Good morning, and thank you very much, Ben. Um, I now have the task of exploring building a Pan-Asia offshore wind market with our panelists in about 20 minutes, so I don't keep you away from your morning break. So I'm going to dive straight into inviting our panelists um, so we can get stuck into the conversation. Um, Your Excellency, uh, Ms. Panella Dahel uh, Kadel Royal from the Royal Danish Embassy Australia, could you join us on stage again, please? Ms. Anne Mai, Executive Director, Offshore Winds Energy, Department of Energy, Environment and Climate Action, State of Victoria. Please welcome Dr. Rowena Christina Guevara, Undersecretary, Department of Energy, the Philippines. Please welcome Mr. Sugat Dharmakirti, 
Additional Secretary, Ministry of Power and Energy from Sri Lanka. And last but not least, I'm pleased to welcome Mr. Pradeep Kumar Das, Chairman and Managing Director of the Indian Renewable Energy Development Agency. A very warm welcome to you all. Um, we're going to dive straight into the questions. Um, this morning, we've heard a lot about um, Australia's ambition and their progress towards offshore wind and green hydrogen. So I'm going to come to you first, um, Under Secretary um, Guevara. Uh, could you talk to us about, about Philippines' journey and your plans moving forward? Thank you very much, and uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, the Philippines is a uh, has a population of 110 million. We have over 7,000 islands and our economic growth is five to 7% per year. Our electric power industry is driven by the private sector with a total dependable generation capacity of 24.8 gigawatts. And renewable energy share currently is at 22%. We have a target of 35% RE by 2030 and 50% RE by 2040. Since November last year, we allow 100% foreign ownership of RE plants. The first 100% foreign-owned RE are three offshore wind projects of the Copenhagen Infrastructure New Market Funds. The Department of Energy has awarded 77 offshore wind projects with a total of 60.3 gigawatts. Our president signed Executive Order 21 to integrate into the Energy Virtual One-Stop Shop all of the identified processes, which will be used by all permitting agencies, including local government units, in processing the application of offshore wind developers. To encourage investment in energy and storage systems, or ESS, we recently issued a policy on ESS that are integrated with renewable energy. We call it RE plus ESS. Hydrogen or green hydrogen is considered ESS. It will receive the same incentives as renewable energy. We're now working with World Bank and Asian Development Bank in developing a smart and green grid system to accommodate our aggressive RE targets. In the future, the excess capacity of our offshore wind farms can be used to produce green hydrogen for transportation, to hybridize 145 of our islands that are currently off-grid and operating on diesel. We would like to use hydrogen also for ancillary services and possibly export to ASEAN member states. We have over 50 years of electronics and semiconductor manufacturing that is 60% of our export. We have copper, nickel, and rare earth metals that are used in batteries, but we need investors for manufacturing or processing these minerals. We have a small shipbuilding industry. We have oil and gas human resources in the Philippines and our overseas Filipino workers who have the same skill set for offshore wind human resource. All these industries can be part of the offshore wind value chain in Asia Pacific. We look forward to cooperating, collaborating, and working with you. Lastly, the likely timing of our first COD for two large commercial scale offshore wind projects is in 2028. And our target is 6,000 megawatts offshore wind by 2032. Thank you for your attention, and we have, we have positive energy throughout the day. Thank you very much. Mr. Dharmakirti, could I now hand over to you? Thank you, Amisha. Now, uh, I think uh, the policy uh, and strategies adopted by each government uh, with regard to the uh, uh, renewable energy is, I think, a key uh, thing that we, uh, we need to uh, focus more, con more focus on uh, in respect of uh, the uh, offshore wind energy. Now, uh, now uh, being a party to the uh, UNFCC, now the Sri Lanka has uh, submitted uh, its nationally determined contributions uh, in 2021 uh, with the ambitious uh, target of uh, reaching 70% uh, renewable energy and 
uh, with no coal power plants in future at the same time. More importantly, the uh, 50, uh, 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 the no uh, net zero carbon by 2050. So I think uh, many other governments has also have also uh, submitted their natural uh, naturally determined contributions uh, with uh, certain targets. Um, the being a country with uh, per capita in, uh, per capita emission is about uh, 1.13 uh, metric tons of uh, has committed uh, uh, to uh, reduce uh, emission 20% uh, uh, by unconditionally conditionally and 5% uh, conditionally uh, by 2030. Then. Uh, now, in 2019, the government of Sri Lanka has introduced the national energy policy, in which uh, the uh, which is based on three uh, dimensions, namely energy security, sustainability, and equity, which are known as the energy trilemma. Uh, so, which also include uh, certain targets uh, for the re uh, achievement of uh, renewable energy uh, in the coming uh, seven years. Uh, in brief, I think uh, we are in the right track uh, towards the process of energy transition in the world. Uh, then uh, when it comes to the uh, offshore wind energy, uh, the experience of Sri Lanka is very limited. So we expect this event could uh, be benefited, uh, we, we will be benefited more by this event uh, to understand the nature of the industry and to gain more insights of uh, offshore uh, wind energy. Uh, you know, the both uh, solar and uh, when, it, when it comes to the benefit of solar, uh, uh, offshore wind energy, the, uh, s uh, compared to the solar and uh, onshore wind, uh, you need significant area of land in which uh, very limited resources uh, in countries like Sri Lanka. Uh, the po population density is more, uh, very high, in the, particularly in the uh, city areas. Uh, then uh, the other is issues uh, like uh, public protests and then the environmental concerns. I think the offshore wind energy is a good option uh, for the consideration of like uh, the countries like uh, Sri Lanka. Then uh, I think again uh, the technology. We uh, we are very primitive. Uh, the being a, being a developing country, the Sri Lanka is very primitive in the in the knowledge, having knowledge about the uh, offshore wind energy. Now, uh, the onshore wind energy and the solar are uh, mature uh, technologies in the country, uh, in our country, but uh, offshore wind energy is uh, very, uh, uh, we are in the, in the uh, primitive stage. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, the contribution for a contribution of smaller, the, we can contribute to uh, being a, even even being a, a smaller economy, we uh, still we can contribute towards the progression of uh, offshore wind energy in the context of uh, supply chain and then uh, sharing uh, sharing resources like port and all that. Uh, I think uh, we are in a position to share our, our things uh, with the progression of uh, offshore wind energy. Um, uh, when it comes to the green hydrogen, I'm not sure that I'm taking much time. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll shorten down. Um, you know, the intermittent nature of the renewable energy, the storage is essential uh, uh, in terms of uh, green hydrogen or pump hydro or uh, uh, better energy storage. Uh, with compared to the better energy storage or uh, the pump hydro, I think, uh, mm, uh, you know, pump hydro is uh, seasonal, perhaps in the rainy season it is not useful, then better energy st systems are very expensive compared to the other two uh, technologies. So uh, in future, I think offshore wind energy uh, could be converted into hydrogen, green hydrogen in future. I think uh, the, we can see over the time the progression of the uh, infusion in of the uh, uh, green hydrogen into the uh, national economies of us. Uh, so I think we can uh, talk later um, more on about it. And Thank I, you. Okay. Um, Mr. Das. Namaste. <coughs> uh, first of all, I'll thank uh, Jivek and uh, Government of Australia for considering me and the Indian Renewable Energy Development Agency, uh, one of the government of India uh, entity, who's working since 37 years for early development in India through policy for handholding the government of India uh, to policy formulation as well as 
most and uh, critical aspect of financing the projects. So, first of all, uh, I'll uh, reiterate one fact that the commitment of development of renewable energy and decarbonization and energy transition, the commitment is coming from none other than the Honorable Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji, who has already declared the Panchamrit target of India to have 50 percent, uh, 500 gigawatt of uh, capacity installation of RE and uh, 50 percent of uh, energy requirement from non-fossil by 2030 and 45 percent of carbon emission reduction of 2050 level by 2030 and reduction of carbon emission of 1 billion tons by 2030 and net, net zero of 2070. So these five Panchamit targets, those are uh, holistically looked into not only by Ministry of uh, Renewable Energy, but by the other ministries who are part and parcel of the economic development of country. And uh, as you know, India is uh, the fourth largest in installed capacity and uh, third largest in the last five years, the growth rate of capacity additions. As on date, we are having 187 gigawatt of non-fossil. Around 156 is in uh, pipeline for installation. and. Uh, uh, 339 is total already planned, which is expected to be done in a couple of years. So, target of 500 gig gigawatt of installation by 2030, perhaps we may achieve before that. And coming back to offshore wind, India is initially looking into two zones, ones of the western co coast of India, that is one Gujarat and Tamil Nadu. And already uh, clear trajectory for 37 gigawatt by 2030 is in place. And we're targeting to have around 100 gigawatt of capacity in the time to come. And already uh, one gigawatt, but there are three models they have made. Because uh, why these uh, three models? As you know that uh, uh, with respect to cost, as well as the construction period for any uh, offshore wind projects is quite different from the uh, onshore wind project. It's roughly a 3x kind of factors. Uh, uh, what of the construction period in case of an onshore wind? Almost three times you require in case of an offshore wind. And similar to that, it's a thumb rule of three times of cost. And uh, when you look into the viability, certainly the developers will not find it encouraging to come initially. And uh, as a matter of fact, since uh, this is uh, the industry is emerging and at a very nascent stage, uh, like any other industry, when it is emerging at a nascent stage, the government needs to handhold. So handholding through the form of uh, in the form of uh, viability gap funding, as well as creating a single point window for coordinating for all the clearances because uh, as you know that India's three sites are coastal and uh, when you think of offshore wind, then your national security issue also will be a major concern. And if you look back past, most of the terrorism uh, issues came from the western coast in particular and southern coast. And since we're looking into that, so national security, uh, the coastal security, as well as the impact on which it is going to have on the local people like the fishermen and all, those need to be looked into. And then a holistic development of uh, separate infrastructure for creating an eco-friendly environment for uh, offshore wind, as well as the green hydrogen. Government of India has already notified the scheme for green hydrogen recently also. And as similar to this, green hydrogen uh, 
globally also it is in a pilot stage not commercially tested much so also in india but we are fortunate uh, uh, when it is pilot stage for all so we are into it and uh, considering our past since our re focused national leadership uh, is so committed uh, in this process of r and d and holistic development uh, the government of india and the respective state governments and as you all know that uh, we have a huge amount we are the largest democracy in the world and we have some 32 odd states and uh, power being the concurrent subject by government of india as well as state government they have to work together for doing this and if you look back uh, the couple of years history of india when it comes to power there is zero politics if you want to have a zero carbon economy then you need to have a zero politics there so that is one of our uh, key uh, strength on which uh, we are envisaging the kind of growth and target what we have committed in cop by on, our honorable prime minister and this is gradually becoming the responsibility of each and every citizen of the country to take into it is not only developing the energy but also usage of energy energy efficiency and decarbonizing it and then holistic transition of renewable energy across all the industries and all. we'll be discussing in detail in the time to come thank you absolutely thank you so much um i think i will go a couple of minutes over time um apologies for that one of the core themes of this conference is collaboration regional global private sector and public sector collaboration so your excellency um i think the government of denmark has a lot of experience in this area so i'd like to come to you first to perhaps share some observations from our experience of the north sea energy cooperation and also cross border collaboration and then on my if i could turn to you with how collaboration um is being approached by the state of victoria and then i'll come to you deputy um evans thank you well thank you very much um Yes, collaboration is of course really key in this, and 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 from a Danish perspective, we are very keen to cooperate uh, with anybody who is who is interested in in this area of whether it is offshore wind or whether it's the development of of the green hydrogen area. Um, we have uh, th there's as there's been a lot of cooperation in the North Sea to set up very large ambitions and large projects, but I think just as important it is that we have signed strategic partnerships with a lot of governments um, that are interested in working with us on, in this field. Prime Minister Albanese and the Danish Prime Minister have just signed a strategic partnership that's very focused, and one of the pillars is on green transition that opens doors for for, for new cooperation with Australia. Um, in this area, similarly, we work with with uh, several other governments, including uh, governments in this in this panel. We work with some of the straight states in Australia. And secondly, the other point that I want to make quickly is that the Danish government's ambitions on on uh, reducing by 70 percent of our carbon emission by 2030. The way we have unfolded that and and made development plans for how we are going to achieve that is in a very very tight cooperation between industry. Street government and researchers, uh, because otherwise, setting an ambitious goal like that, where you actually don't know how you're going to get there, unless you, you get that collaboration in place, you are not going to achieve your ambitious targets. So these types of cooperations are really important. <coughs> Thank you, Han. Thanks. Um, I guess we in the state of Victoria view collaboration through a few lenses. One is as the ambassador has. Uh, discussed uh, regional uh, lens and working with our um, colleagues in the APAC region we think will be really important um, in cooperation with the Australian government to really build a pipeline that's an aggregation of the APAC region's potential. And we know we're up against some really huge targets in Northern Europe and in the States um, and the strength of the Inflation Reduction Act in attracting investment. And so really working together in our region to build um, and establish offshore wind in the APAC region and leverage all of our different targets and all of our different objectives into something that is quite substantial um, and build that pipeline for the entire region and also service each other 
in uh, areas where we have strengths, um, we think will be really important. I think the other kind of lens of collaboration that we look at is collaborating with the community. Um, yes, we have a huge declared area in Gippsland, it's 15,000 square kilometres. Um, but we are in Australia where people are used to huge landscapes, lots of space and unblighted sight lines. And so working with our communities to understand the importance of renewable energy as a key element to preserve our environment and to continue to enjoy our environment whilst we um, develop offshore wind sustainably um, to protect our marine um, environment, our biodiversity and our really rich cultural in, um, values as well, we think will be really important. Uh, I guess finally, and why many of you are here, is we want to collaborate with industry. We want to keep learning as to what will be the fastest way home. As the ambassador talked about, it's not just getting there, it's getting there at pace. Um, the targets we've set, which are 95% renewable energy by 2035 in Victoria, are highly ambitious. But if we are to reach net zero by 2045, because as a state, we brought forward our net zero target, from 2050 to 2045, we have to knuckle down and not just set a target, but we are systematically working through our plan of how we reach that target. And I think all of that requires collaboration and learning and listening to the industry about what you need, what um, is important, and what barriers government can uh, remove or alleviate to speed up the delivery of our renewable energy. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, and perhaps the only additional layer of collaboration I might add, because I'd otherwise completely agree with everything uh, that Arne has just described uh, and, 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 and also um, the way that Her Excellency has described the international collaboration, the extra lens is um, the layers of government within each of our countries. So I think pretty much everyone here, I'm not 100% sure about Denmark actually, we have um, you know, federation of states as well as a, as a commonwealth, in our case, layer of government. And we're quite conscious that for these industries to succeed, uh, all of those uh, parts of government have to be working together. Uh, and certainly in Victoria, we've had a really rich collaboration um, going, which we've, you know, formalised uh, in the form of a memorandum of understanding to make sure that we are working together to make sure that the regulatory frameworks are seamless across the Victorian waters and the Commonwealth waters, for example, on offshore wind, uh, and to look at those issues that uh, Arne is referring to around, you know, how do you create a steady beat of projects, you know, how do you have a supply chain and a pipeline that is steady enough to be able to properly attract the kind of investment that we would like to see in Australia um, to really sort of capitalise on the growth of this industry. Uh, so we've been working with all of the states and territories, um, not just with Victoria, but at a Commonwealth, at the, at the federal level, we have a working group that involves all of the states and territories to think about uh, offshore wind and the industry development and hydrogen um, to make sure that that collaboration is also really effective. Thank you very much. And unfortunately, we have run out of time. Um, so I will conclude here. Um, just to note, our panelists will be available for networking um, during the break. So please do come and introduce yourselves. And um, can you please join me in thanking our panelists in, in the usual way?